Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Fish Passage Rulemaking Technical Workshop. My name is Ben Floyd. I'm a facilitator with White Bluffs Consulting. I've been asked by Washington uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife to help facilitate these public meetings uh, that we've been holding. And so we appreciate everybody joining us today. Going to go through some quick uh, overview of ground rules and, and purpose of the meeting and then pass it off to a few of the WFW folks to welcome you and I'll introduce them when we get to that point um, and then we'll get started. So next slide, please. So because this is a live event, um, we have the opportunity to take questions from the public as well as comments. Uh, those that are here today uh, participating in the workshop, we have a full support team that's available to track the comments and uh, and then we'll refer them to the appropriate uh, present presenters and technical subject experts from Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, throughout the meeting. Um, so you, if you're familiar with Microsoft Teams, there's the Q&A function you've probably seen in there. Thank you for joining us, we'll get started. And then you've seen another comment here from Rachel uh, with the department who says, you're always welcome to provide comments or ask questions by emailing. So that's another way that you can participate. If for some reason the Q&A is not working for you, um, you, can, you can use that function. Um, and so uh, that provides an opportunity for you to participate as we go along. Um, we are uh, having, uh, you know, using this chat function or this Q&A function as a way to queue up questions. Uh, we won't ask the questions during the time that the presenter is sharing information, but at the end of their presentation, when the question slide is coming up, that's where I'll jump back in and and uh, address any questions that uh, you have asked uh, to them, and uh, and we'll respond to them at this time, at that time. Next slide, please. So today um, we're sharing with you kind of an overview of what the rulemaking process looks like. It's divided up into three phases. The first phase, uh, which was actually completed uh, in uh, early July, was a notice that the state agency, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, is undertaking rulemaking um, for the fish passage rule process. So that was published July 1st in the state register. The second phase is when the agency will file proposed rule language. And so we're in between that first step, announcing that we're registering or that we're uh, publishing the notice uh, and the second step where we're going to be working on the rule language. And so you're going to hear today about some of the things that are being considered in the rule language, an overview of, of how the process will evolve and uh, opportunities for additional public input as we go along. The third step uh, after a proposed rule language is, is published, then there are public hearings uh, that will be held and then the, the last step is a final rule filing, um, which lasts for 30 days and then it becomes in effect. Um, and so again, as the note says here, we're in the process between the 101 and 102, trying to get general feedback as well as get everybody on the same uh, level of understanding in terms of what the steps are, the elements of the rule that are being considered. Um, we're sharing information today about kind of where the rulemaking process is heading and we're hoping to get your input, questions and comments uh, ahead of actually starting to then craft uh, outlines and specific rule elements as we go along. The plan is uh, to use this fall to craft the rule and then later in the year uh, have draft language available um, to share or in early 2021 have draft language available to share um, ahead of the actual filing of the proposed rule language. And there will be opportunities for public input this fall, additional opportunities for public input early in 2021, and then through the formal public hearing process going forward. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk to you about, <clears throat> excuse me, why the agency is, is going through the rulemaking process. You're going to get a quick overview from um, from, I'm sorry, <laughs> Tom Jameson, sorry Tom, uh, about just the fish passage rulemaking process, 
uh, as well as an introduction from Morgan Carlson, uh, who is the uh, director of the Habitat Program or the um, program manager for the Habitat Program. And then uh, we have three technical presentations, one on screening, one on fish passage, and one on climate adaptive structures. And as you'll see in the slide here, there's opportunity for Q&A uh, for each of these presentations. Then we'll open it up for a general discussion at the end uh, to see if there are any additional questions or comments, and then we'll conclude with next steps. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Margaret Carlson and, uh, and she'll uh, complete the introduction and then pass it off to Tom. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as, as Ben said, my name is Morgan Carlson. I'm the director of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Habitat Program. Um, mostly uh, the meat of the presentation is not me and it's the people you're gonna hear from shortly. But I did wanna take a moment just to express my gratitude for you setting aside some time out of uh, a bit, what I'm sure is a busy day to join us here today, uh, particularly in light of all the things going on in all of our personal and professional lives. I know setting aside a couple of hours to be on another video meeting is a lot. Um, so again, thank you for being here and welcome. Um, we were excited um, to talk with you today. We are using a technique that we found to be really helpful in other issue areas. As Ben said, we don't have proposed rule language today, but what we found is that hosting these technical workshops is a really great way to share with you some of our very, very preliminary thinking, to share with you some of the programs and techniques that we already have in place, um, and to highlight a few questions where we uh, particularly need help and feedback. And the intent is that, that these technical presentations really support ongoing conversation, ongoing dialogue, and really are intended to give you as much information as possible to give us um, really robust feedback about what you would like to see in rulemaking so that later on in the late fall, early winter, when we're coming back to you, we've had a chance to incorporate as much of the feedback as possible into our proposed rule language. Um, as you'll, you'll hear a little bit more, um, we do have some robust programs that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has been in the fish passage and in particular the screening game for a long time. Um, and again, we're really looking forward to your feedback about how to utilize what we have in place now and hopefully how to make it even more effective um, and reflective of good government and good outcomes moving forward. Um, I'm gonna hang on, uh, be part of the dialogue, really listen to the feedback that you have to say. Um, but again, after expressing a welcome, I'd like to hand it off to Tom Jamison to give you a little bit more of an overview of today's work. Thank you, Morgan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Morgan said, I, I'm Tom Jamison. I am the Fish Passage and Screening Division Manager, uh, which is a division within Morgan's Habitat Program, uh, which is within the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, as both Morgan and Ben have said, um, I wanna thank you today for, for participating um, in this outreach briefing. Um, we are very interested in getting your feedback um, about this rulemaking process uh, that we're gonna discuss with you today. Uh, as Ben said, we are just beginning this process. Um, we have filed what's called a CR 101, which is a public notice that we've begun a rulemaking process. And then the next step is what we're doing here today, which is conducting a series of outreach briefings. Uh, we've done outreach briefings so far with tribal nations, uh, with cities and with counties. This is our first outreach briefing to the general public. And uh, by doing these outreach briefings, we're, we're trying to get off on the right foot by providing you with information on, on the law, the current law, uh, and information on fish passage screening and climate adaptive crossings um, to, to really enable you to, to provide us feedback on the rulemaking process. Next slide, please. The revised code of Washington or RCW that we're conducting rulemaking upon is RCW 77 dot 57. It's entitled Fishways, Flow, and Screening. Uh, you can see how the RCW is broken down into sections on the slide. The RCW actually has eight sections, um, 010 through 080. 
uh, but we're only conducting rulemaking on six of those eight sections. Uh, we are not conducting rulemaking on section 020, um, which concerns water. Uh, it's really water flow policy. Uh, it's a service that we provide to the Department of Ecology uh, in reviewing water right applications that, that come into them. The, um, we are also not uh, conducting rulemaking on section 080, which concerns the operation and maintenance of the fish collection facility on the Toodle River. The Toodle River is an outflow river from Mount St. Helens in southern Washington. The, uh, the reason we're starting this rulemaking process is based on a recommendation from the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force, which is abbreviated SRKW. That task force was formed in 2018 uh, when it became apparent that the resident pods of, of killer whales uh, within Puget Sound uh, were, were in decline. Um, offspring were being born and not surviving uh, more than a few days. Um, the, the, the actual orca themselves were uh, getting leaner and leaner, less fat, and uh, their birth rate uh, was, was decreasing, so their numbers were decreasing. Um, the, the task force determined that one of the primary reasons that the orca in Puget Sound were declining is because of um, the basically starving to death. Um, there just wasn't enough prey for those orca to sustain themselves on. Uh, the orca prefer their main prey source is Chinook or King salmon. That's the largest of the Pacific salmon species. And as you may know, the numbers of Chinook salmon in Puget Sound waters have been declining. Um, so the task force, one of the task force recommendations was um, for Fish and Wildlife to begin a rulemaking process for fish passage, fish screening, and climate adaptive crossings. Next slide, please. The current statutory authority, that basically the gist of the authority that's granted to Fish and Wildlife is to require effective fish passage and effective fish screening. However, the, the laws that, um, that we have in place, they haven't been updated in about 70 years. Uh, and so surprisingly, or, or not surprisingly, uh, the language uh, in the current law is very outdated. In particular, the specific remedies that the law um, requires uh, are what we would say is, is very heavy handed. Um, they really don't reflect um, the more recent direction that the legislature has given all natural resource agencies, and they really don't reflect the values that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has. Um, in particular, the legislature passed RCW 4305 which directed not only Fish and Wildlife, but other natural resource agencies uh, to take a series of steps before penalizing landowners for, for violations. First agencies are to inform the landowner that he or she needs to, what, what they need to do to be in compliance with the law and then offer technical assistance uh, in making a correction. Um, Fish and Wildlife is not able to issue fines for fish passage and fish screening violations. Um, as a result, uh, our main goals are, next slide please. We want to better codify what we have found to be the best practices and to get feedback from you for what actions you think we should take for in-stream structures, fish screening, and how climate change may affect the structures we're building upon predictions of the flows we expect to see in the future. Uh, we want to assist landowners to be in compliance with the law. It, at the end of the rulemaking process, at the end of the rulemaking process, we want to have clear standards. We want to have a clear way to ensure compliance with the law. And we want to have clear remedies for non-compliance that are acceptable to all. Uh, we're using a rulemaking approach that the agency has been successful with in our other rulemaking efforts. That involves workshops with tribal nations, the general public like yourselves, and stakeholders. Uh, as I mentioned, 
cities and counties. Um, and um, to do that, we want to provide technical details about fish passage and screen to build a general understanding of the issues and then solicit your feedback. So uh, at this point, if you have any questions for me, you can go ahead and, and ask those. And, and I'll pause here before I introduce the, the first speaker. So we're looking at the Q&A, Tom, and we're not seeing any questions being asked. All right, then I'd, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. The um, uh, first up with the first technical briefing, and again, we're gonna keep these briefings uh, as relatively simple as possible, because I know we have a very, um, kind of a varied audience today. Uh, so the first speaker uh, is Danny Didrickson. Danny manages our uh, our fish screening section, which is headquartered in Yakima, Washington. So Danny, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate the introduction. I'm excited to talk with everybody today about fish screening. It's my favorite thing. I've been doing this since 2013, and I think that fish screening is a really fun thing to work on because of the amount of interaction you get to have with people. In terms of fish protection, I love that you can complete a project and you know you're protecting protecting fish life right away. It's a fun feeling and I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot view of how we go about doing that in this presentation today. Next slide please. I'll start with a little bit of an overview. Our goal as Tom mentioned is to encourage feedback from you to make sure that WFW is considering everything we need to as we go about better explaining this RCWs through rulemaking. Uh, we want to know if you have input, if you have questions, if you have anything that might help us guide how we mold our um, policies around fish screening, love to hear it. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction and background about fish screening and how it's happened in Washington. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about how we go about doing things right now. I'll give you some examples of fish screens and some examples of what are not fish screens. And then hopefully you guys will have some questions. Next slide, please. So one important, one important thing is to come to some common understanding about what a fish screen is. It's something that I run into a lot when I'm working with people. They don't even know what fish screens are sometimes. There's a big variation in knowledge is what I'm getting at. So for the purposes of our talk today, fish screens are facilities that prevent fish, primarily young fish, fish with poor swimming capabilities and larvae from being entrained into surface water diversions. Now, Really, when fish screens are used, we try to set them up so that fish never come in contact with the screen. The idea is not to have a water intake and then a fish screen where fish come in and bounce off of it and are just physically prevented from going down somewhere they're not supposed to. Is that sort of what happens? Well, in concept, yes, but we try to arrange things with site setup so that the fish never come in contact and they just volitionally pass by the screens. Uh, I'll direct your attention to the two images below. The one on the left is a gravity diversion. So water comes in from a point of higher elevation, goes down an intake canal, and you'll see there's sort of a silver cylindrical structure running across the waterway there. That's the fish screen. It slowly rotates. It's a tried and true design. It's been around for about a hundred years in Washington, so we're pretty familiar with it. Many water users are really familiar with it. Very common, especially in eastern Washington. The image on the right is a pump diversion. Uh, pump up on the hill, pipe going down, and a compliant fish screen on the end of it in the water. Pretty self-explanatory, but next slide, please. I wanted to show just sort of a cartoony image to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. The image on the left, again, is a gravity diversion. There's a lot of different ways these can be set up. In this particular example, there is a channel spanning dam. It helps keep the water checked up to the elevation it needs to so that they're sure their diversion, which is behind the head gate there, as you see, um, is always wetted up and getting the amount of water that they need to facilitate their water right. So as water passes through a head gate or a trash rack or whatever it might be there, they're still fish in it. We need the fish to be taken back to the natural system before they head out into a field somewhere. Some distance down this intake canal, there is a fish screen. And this is the part where things get important. This is where we wanna make sure that the fish come into the site and are just encouraged to go down this bypass pipe or bypass channel as quickly as possible and back to the natural system. So we can keep them safe and we get clean screened water back to the people that need it. 
The image on the right is a pump screen, a little bit more intuitive, like we were saying, it's got a compliant fish screen on the end. There's an intake pipe going into a pump and then a delivery pipe behind it. Next, next slide, please. So unfortunately, you know, Tom mentioned the RCWs. We know that it's legally required and has been since 1949. We know that there has been sort of um, a lack of universal understanding about what fish screens are and what needs to happen. So we're trying to fix that to present or to prevent, sorry, these things. We don't want to see fish dead in canals. Many of you are probably aware that uh, water rights for agricultural purposes often have seasons attached to them. Maybe you start taking your water in April and you're done in mid-October. Well, there's if you don't have a fish screen and you're, you're taking water through your canal all year, but then you stop taking water, pockets develop in the intake canals. They're not all concrete lined, you know, pretty water slides for fish. Sometimes these wells develop and fish are unfortunately trapped in them. And that's what you see in the image on your left. The image on the right is what happens when a small fish goes through an unscreened pump diversion. Fish don't like going through impellers, not really fish friendly. This is what we're trying to prevent. Next slide, please. So I think it's important when we start talking about what our current practices are that we have some level of understanding on what the current challenge is. We've got over 49,000 points of surface water diversion in the state of Washington. These green blurs are actually individual dots. Now, not all of the dots on this map occur in fish bearing waters. Some of them are on springs or above big natural barriers or something to that effect but there's a lot of them that do, and there's a lot of work to be done here, and we're excited to do it. Next slide, please. So we know that fish screening has been around for a long time. We started doing it in the Yakima shop. We have a construction shop that has built gravity diversion fish screens since the early 1900s. The shop was officially founded in 1946. Uh, so we've been doing this for quite a while. The first screens we built were compliant drum screens. They were actually used out on the Olympic Peninsula in the Dungeness River system. Uh, those were successful over the years. WFW, along with some private water users, have been building different types of fish screens. Now there's a very wide variety of fish screens that we use, not only these drum screens, um, but our Yakima shop does a great job building them. I'll talk more about those guys in a little bit. Uh, the Eastern Washington focus was really an artifact of the fact that this shop is in Yakima and there's a lot of big agriculture. So we kind of missed some of the targeted outreach we could have been doing, say, in the Puget Sound Basin, a lot of where the Southern Resident Killer Whale work is being done. So we're hoping to address that now. Um, we are funded through varying sources, grants. We get some state general funds. It's all at Habitat programs, discretion as to how much money goes where for that. We really appreciate the investment that they put into fish screening. It's really worth it. Uh, and maybe the most important thing I can tell you about our current practices is our technical assistance abilities. Anybody that's using water in the state can give us a call and ask if what they're doing is already up to snuff. They can ask, hey, we need a fish screen. What do we get? And we will work with you. It's not like a phone call where we demand you do something tomorrow. We try to make sure that people understand why they need to screen for fish compliantly. We try to educate them where they might have questions. We try to be partners working with them and remember that the people using the water usually know a lot more about the local spot they take their water from than we will. So it's important to know what they know before we make a fish screening recommendation. This is the start of a partnership. And when we find that people have long-term investment in their fish screens, it's just much more successful going forward into the future. And we create a, a restoration partner and a fish protection partner. You don't see a lot of people that just don't like fish so the reasons that they don't have a fish screen are either they didn't know, maybe it was too expensive and they couldn't afford it. There's a variety of reasons, but our plan will be to bring them on board as working partners and help them get to where they need to be. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce you to some of the people that work on our fish screening team. These are the biologists that work in the habitat program. Jenny Novak is based out of Wenatchee and covers the upper Columbia River and its tributaries. Sean Taylor works out of Walla Walla and covers the Snake River Basin in southeastern Washington. Josh Regala works out of, with me out of the Yakima Construction Shop. 
and covers the Yakima Basin. And the newest member of our team is Katrina Simmons. And Katrina is based out of Olympia in the Natural Resources Building. And she is going to be in charge of being responsive for all the fish screening questions in Western Washington, which I will be helping her with since I have statewide coverage. Katrina is making a particular effort in the Northern Puget Sound area right now. She just started with us in April. COVID has definitely impaired our ability to do what we wanted to do, but we're working through it and we're happy that we're engaged with local restoration partners and some local um, irrigators that have actually been really fun to work with. And it's nice to get um, a foothold in Western Washington. So we look forward to working with many more people. Next slide. I mentioned that we have the Yakima Construction Shop that's got between nine and 11, depending on the year, full-time uh, maintenance mechanics, fabricators, supervisors, uh, people that have a lot of institutional knowledge about fish screening. One thing that it's really important to remember about fish screens is it's not necessarily a put it in and walk away type of solution. It takes maintenance. Our guys can can uh, go around and check things out, particularly in eastern Washington is where they're specializing doing this on the gravity diversions. They make sure things are going right. They inspect the screens throughout the irrigation season, and it's a really nice program that yields great benefits for fish and water users alike. And I think that's a point that I really can't drive home enough. We don't want to put a fish screen in that will be a problem for a water user. We want to help make sure that the right fish screen goes in. Hopefully they'll be getting cleaner water more efficiently than they were before. Next slide, please. So we've kept it pretty general. There are an awful lot of criteria that go into fish screening that determines whether or not a specific screen is compliant. I've got a couple reference materials down below. That's probably the biggest takeaway I could point to from this slide. There's the WFW manual about fish passage and inventory assessment, barrier assessment manual. That will be discussed more in the following presentation. That has chapter nine dedicated to fish screening. And then the image on the right is of the National Marine Fishery Services manual. Chapter 11 in that document is dedicated to fish screening. And both of them, are good. They are mirrors of each other. They do not contradict each other because WDFW staff helped write the NOAA manual or at least provide edit suggestions. So it's nice that you're not going to go to one source and then find conflicting data in another. Uh, you can also just contact our individual staff members for some guidance. Next slide, please. So pictures are fun. What I've got here are some examples of things that are not fish screens. It's probably not a big surprise to most of you that a garbage can with some wire and a pipe sticking into it does not constitute a compliant fish screen. I can tell you that luckily this irrigator was more than willing to work with us, just didn't know what they needed to do. And they got set up with a very compliant fish screen that works great. They maintain it less. It works better for them. It's one of those mutually beneficial happy situations that we're always striving to achieve. The image on the right is a little more tricky. If you don't know what goes into a compliant fish screen, things like foot valves or variations on debris screens might look like fish screens. It's a piece of physical structure that prevents fish from going into the pipe. That must be a screen. That's not quite true. Uh, it's missing some key components that really go into the effectiveness of fish screening. Next slide, please. The images on this page are compliant fish screens. The bigger image on the left is a big cylindrical screen. You can see it's on some circular stands. Stands can be any shape, really square, triangle. But what I'll point your attention to is that that cylinder, all that cylinder is fish screen material. It's compliant opening size. Inside of that outer structure is an internal, internal baffling system that makes sure you get uniform water flow across the whole thing. You know, this thing has a pipe or a hose connected to one end of it and a pump that's pulling water out. You'd think that water would be pulled through faster near the hose or pipe connection, right? Well, that internal baffling prevents that. It also helps the, take, the screen take water when things like picture a big maple leaf coming down a river or creek, maybe comes pinned up against it. Well, that prevents hot spots or faster flow around the edges of the leaf over the occluded area. That's just a couple of the many compliance things that go into this. There's been independent scientific testing and review that let us know that we can recommend this screen type, and there's many others, uh, safely knowing that we'll be both getting people the water they need and protecting the fish life. The image on the upper right has is a self-cleaning pump screen. It is called a river screen. It's a company that's based out of Kansas, 
many of these have been put in in the state of Washington. It's got an internal spray bar and as that circular or that cylindrical barrel there that's between the pontoons, this thing floats kind of up on the surface and draws water from near the top. It slowly spins and the water shoots out from an internal spray bar and keeps the screen clean. So it's always drawing in new water. The image on the bottom right is one of those gravity diversion drum screens. I like this picture because it shows where the fish bypass starts. If you see the fish screen is that gray cylinder laying kind of diagonal through the picture. And then at the downstream end of it, you see that dark square and that's actually the bypass entrance. So as you see, you can kind of tell by the way the concrete is lined up. Flow is directed straight that way anyway. That's where we get into the not having fish come in contact with the screen at all. Next slide, please. Well, I want to thank you guys for listening to me. And while this has been really broad and I probably said a lot of things that need a lot more explanation, um, I hope that you might ask some questions to help us better shape how we come up with this fish screening rulemaking process. And anything that you have to add in or ask, I'd be happy to answer. We look forward to working with everybody in the future. My next slide is questions. And if you have any, I'd be glad to take them. And if not, thank you for listening. Well done, well done. Danny. We do have some questions. So we have one from a Steve Lewis. And here's the question. It is, so the National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service prescribe fishways for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC managed hydro projects on the main stem Columbia River. Would this, and this is the question, would this new rulemaking change WDFW fish passage authorities for these FERC Federal Energy Regulatory Commission projects? Um, I'm sorry, do I? Oh, there we go. Now I'm back on. I wasn't sure if I had the screen. Sorry about that. Well, that's a very interesting and in-depth question and clearly has some very large ramifications. I'll, I'll say if Morgan or Tom wants to jump in at any point, uh, that would be just fine. Uh, this is different from the FERC process. This is our state law and we are not going to try to supersede federal process uh, for fish screening. Um, you know, this is hopefully what we're doing here is just clarifying what needs to be done. We're not adding new requirements on top of what's already out there. We're just trying to better explain how to go about doing it and making sure everybody's aware of the resources they have to accomplish compliant fish screening. FERC questions, I'm involved in several FERC processes right now, and boy, they get in depth and they are complicated and important. And there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake with those. So luckily this process will not impact those processes. Um, and I'm not exactly sure if I've answered that fully. Uh, Tom or Morgan, do you have anything you might want to add to that? Yeah, sure, Danny, I, I'll add to that. Hey, everybody. Um, so the, the really short answer is no, this rulemaking doesn't change Department of Fish and Wildlife's engagement in the FERC process. Um, the FERC process, as it sounds like this, this person knows, is a federal process. Um, and in that federal process, the states and the state's opinions and expertise are advisory to the federal process in making decisions. Um, that said, we have a long history of working really cooperatively both with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission itself <coughs> as well as with the other federal agencies. And so as Danny said, I think the, the biggest value of this rulemaking, because we have had such a, a long and robust program for both passage and screening, one of the big values of this rulemaking will be to make more transparent what DFW's expertise and um, expectations are around fish passage and screening. Again, just making that more transparent to other people, including when they're engaged in the federal process about um, what Washington hopes we will achieve in terms of fish passage and fish screening protections. Good question. Great. Thank you, Danny and Morgan, both uh, great answers as well. Uh, and if if there's some part of a question that you ask that doesn't get answered, feel free to rephrase it, shoot it back to us, um, and we'll try to respond to it as well. We have another question. This is from uh, Eileen Levy, and forgive me if I didn't pronounce your name exactly correct, um, but the question is, if you know, does WDFW have more, less, or the same ability to address fish and environment issues as ecology? If, WSW, if WDFW's ability is less, can you consider using their water impact rules as a model? 
maybe maybe I can take that one then. Um, great question, Eileen. Um, so the the Washington State Legislature usually tries to be as clear as they can in um, designating leads in the executive branch, and um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, has been tasked by the legislature at being Washington State's fish experts, and so uh, they've tasked the Department of Ecology with a number of other environmental lead roles, whether that's uh, about the state environmental policy act or water issues for example and um, so some of the direction that we've gotten is for the department of fish and wildlife to advise the department of ecology about how the water rules or other environmental rules that they're considering that they're the lead on how those potential rules and programs would affect fish um, so I, I would say Department of Fish and Wildlife um, has invested in having the fish expertise. There are a lot of really smart people at the Department of Ecology and I'm really been, I'm, I'm grateful, at least in my experience, we do a lot of collaboration um, and support. So I'm, I'm hesitating about the part that is saying uh, more or less. Um, but the other thing I would say is I'm not very familiar with the uh, the water program that Eileen mentioned. And so if they're even though DFW is the, the fish expertise for the state, if there are aspects of the way Department of Ecology runs that program that you think work well um, and that you like to see us try to model or be consistent with, that's wonderful feedback and we'd really welcome your more detailed observations. And that way we can look into whether there's um, any overlap or um, something important for us to be consistent with. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I, I'd say we're the fish experts and, and look forward to anything else you might advise us on, Eileen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Morgan, for those response for that response. And it looks like those are the two questions that we've received so far related to fish passage. So, and I'm not seeing Rachel, any others in the queue. So with that, let's go ahead and move to our second technical presentation. So this is a presentation by Christy Rains. Uh, you can see her uh, title in there. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Christy and she's gonna tell you a little bit about fish passage barriers and how those might be considered in the rulemaking process. Christy. Thanks, Ben. And good afternoon, everyone. As Ben said, I'm Christy Rains and I am the Fish Passage Inventory and Assessment Section Manager at WDFW. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about fish passage barriers and what our section and our division does to, um, to better understand them and support them and remove them. Next, please. Okay, we went over the RCW that we are um, hoping to get feedback on and the particular one that um, this technical presentation is supporting is RCW 77-57-030. And I provided a summary of that statute there. But in a nutshell, what, the, what this statute um, tells us is that we know that man-made in-stream features such as dams and other obstructions can be barriers to um, fish passage, that, that they can block the free passage of fish. Um, and if someone owns one of these fish passage barriers, so one is found on um, someone's property, then that landowner is responsible for removing or correcting that fish passage barrier. And then it goes on to say if you, um, if the landowner does not correct um, some barriers within a specific amount of time or some certain amount of time that WDFW may um, choose to remove that barrier for the landowner with some implication to the landowner. So um, as Tom mentioned, the statute was written in 1949. Um, at that time, they, they made reference to potentially putting liens on people's property. Um, that's one of the things that we're here to discuss is, as well as a lot of the old language. We know a lot more about fish passage and about fish passage barriers. And um, we also have different ways of operating as a society. Next slide. So 
Um, in this presentation, I will share a little bit more about the established processes that we already have in the Fish Passage Division and WDFW um, that we would employ to implement this portion of the RCW. And some of those things are we know how to define in-stream features. We have protocols to determine barrier status of those in-stream features, as well as to determine um, fish habitat. We have preferred methods for correcting barriers in the stream. So, um, you know, full removal is fantastic, but we have other um, other designs that we can implement that we know freely pass fish. Next slide. Here are some of the questions that um, that that I'm thinking about, and um, I'm also interested to hear what uh, you all are thinking about after this uh, technical presentation, but. In implementing this art portion of the RCW, how would we use our current tools to address correction? So I'm gonna share a bunch of our tools um, following. What variables might we consider to order and prioritize corrections? So there, there's, um, you'll, you're gonna see the magnitude of the problem on the, on the landscape. And um, so we really need to take a look at how do we go about determining where and when and finally, how do we interact with barrier owners? Next. This statute does um, consider all species of fish for fish passage, but for the purposes of the protocols that I'm going to be describing to you and that we use in the fish passage division, um, I'm, gonna de I'm gonna define what I mean by fish passage. Um, first, the species that I'm interested in are the five Pacific salmon, coho, chinook, chum, pink, and sockeye, as well as the steelhead trout. And when I'm talking about our barrier protocols, I'm talking about the ability of the adult of those species to be able to pass unhindered through man-made or natural features during flows when we would expect those adults to be moving. Next slide. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the anadromous life cycle of the, of the salmon and steelhead. Um, I'm just going to focus in there. Um, I've circled the portion of the life cycle that we are specifically interested in when we are assessing in-stream features for fish passage barriers. We are looking at those adults. Um, the adults spend most of their life in the ocean. They come back to their freshwater water natal streams to spawn and start their cycle over again. But it's at that point where a significant proportion of their freshwater habitat is currently blocked due to fish passage barriers. And again, that's, that's why our protocols are geared towards looking at the, the passage of adult salmon to be able to get up to their spawning habitat. Next. I'm just going to share a couple of in-stream features that we see often. Um, th this particular statute mentions dams and other obstructions. So here are a couple of dams, for examples. Dams are installed in streams and rivers to impede the downstream flow of water, thereby impounding water upstream. And it's that impounding water upstream that's important to us. That and we. We want to impound water for several reasons. There's a, a list of, of um, several of those down the center of the screen there. The picture on our left was a hydroelectric dam. I say was because this one was actually one of the Elwha River dams that has since been removed. And the picture on the right is of a small privately owned stock or farm pond. Um, but regardless of the size of these dams, or ownership or purpose, it's easy to see how these features are barriers to um, fish passage, how they may hinder the adults from being able to make it upstream to spawning habitat. Next slide. Another um, very common uh, in-stream feature on the landscape are road culverts. So here I'm just gonna show you a little bit, uh, we'll show you how things have changed over time. Here I'm showing you a picture of a USGS historic topo map. It is of the Big Seuss Creek drainage from 1897. And you can see that there are some roads that are crossing over that drainage. Next. But if we fast forward and overlay a 2003 road network map, you can see that that drainage is just completely crisscrossed with roads. And presumably at each point where road crosses over the water or stream or wetland, there's some sort of water crossing feature. And when you're lower on the, the landscape where you have really 
uh, deep and wide rivers, you likely have bridges. Next slide. But by and large, what you're going to find at um, most of these locations are road culverts, like you see here. Here's three examples throughout that drainage. And when road culverts were designed and installed on the landscape, they were not designed with fish passage in mind. They were designed to get water from one side of the roadway to the other so that the road had stability. And consequently, a significant proportion of these features are barriers to fish passage today. Next slide. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you about um, several of the services that uh, WDFW Fish Passage Division provides in the way of fish passage barriers and corrections. Next slide. So this is where we want to think about the first question that I posed, which was how do we use our current tools to implement this RCW? And um, so here's a list. We have a protocol that um, gives information on how to identify salmon and steelhead habitat, as well as how to assess barrier status of in-stream features and natural barriers. We have a centralized database to house these assessments, as well as that database is available to the public. We provide free training on our protocols. We have um, habitat surveys, um, and this is important when we're thinking about how to order and prioritize barriers on the landscape. Habitat surveys are a good tool um, to help us with that. Uh, it's where we consider all life stages of the salmon, not just the adult phase as we do when we're doing barrier assessments. We also have uh, provide guidance and support for barrier corrections and fish passage improvement structures. And we provide ongoing technical assistance on all of these things and more. Next slide. Danny introduced this uh, in his last in his part of the talk. So this is our fish passage inventory assessment and prioritization manual. It was most recently updated in 2019. We had two previous versions, um, one in 2000 and 2009. And the biggest thing that I want to share with you about those updates is that the core barrier assessment protocol from the 2000 manual has has remained unchanged. What has changed is that through providing our fish passage training and providing support to um, our partners out on the landscape, doing inventory and assessment and correction work, um, we realized that we really needed to provide a lot more clarity on why we're collecting the measurements that we are and what our assessments are actually telling us. So that's what you're really going to find. Um, that's what what thickened this 2019 manual up. Um, and then as Danny mentioned, it also has information on screening. And um, finally, we use this manual and these protocols to implement the US versus Washington culvert injunction. Next. There are three criteria that we assess for, for when we're assessing in-stream features for their barrier status. Water surface drop, shallow water depth, and high water velocity. And I just want you to take a note of the aspect of these pictures that they're taken from downstream of the of the feature that's in the stream looking upstream. So it's basically um, as the adult salmon and steelhead would be approaching these in-stream features. Um, that's really how we step through our, our protocols. You know, as they're approaching, what are they going to be um, encountering water surface drops? Are they going to be encountering this um, a shallow water depth? Or is the water just going to be pulsing out of that culvert so intensely um, that it might be high water velocity? And then we obviously go about um, collecting our data and taking measurements. Next slide. And I'll just remind you that our, our uh, barrier protocols are based on the ability of the adult salmonids. And to make sure that we are taking a conservative approach and um, allowing for all of the species of interest to be able to pass through these features, um, we do take a conservative approach, meaning that, um, for instance, for water surface drop or velocity criteria, we look at the weakest swimmer and leaper, which is the six inch trout. And for depth criteria, we consider the largest of the species, which is the adult Chinook. Next slide. We have barrier assessment protocol for all types of in-stream features, whether they be dams or fishways. Um, but as I mentioned, culverts are, are 
the most dominant barrier on the landscape. So I'll just briefly describe um, what an assessment looks like for culverts. We have two levels. We have a level A and the level A is meant to quickly identify the most obvious barriers through measuring water surface drop and slope. Slope being a surrogate for depth and velocity. And if we can't determine barrier status from level A, then we do a level B, which is a simple hydraulic analysis where we do cross sections and uh, measurements of the pipe and, and downstream slopes so that we can do a simple hydraulic analysis to determine depth and velocity. Next. So what is all of this uh, information leading towards? So we have the we have a protocol. We're doing these assessments on the landscape. We're collecting all of those data in a centralized database. What it's helping us to see is the magnitude of the problem. And um, we moved on, but you saw that there's there's dots all over on on that map. Um, thank you. And um, just note too, this is just the uh, little snippet of Washington, the northwest corner. It also happens to be um, the culvert case in junction, the case area, which are RIAs 1 to 23. And I also want you to note that this is just three ownership types that I'm showing here, because I just wanted to give you just a quick snapshot and be able to see more than just a big blur on a map. But there are there are a lot of barriers on the landscape. And um, but what this helps us to do is start taking a look at um, and thinking about where we might want to focus in our attention, where might we need to do a little bit more work, where maybe have we not focused enough effort on inventory and assessment to have a complete picture. Next slide. And then um, I just wanted to bring back around again. Um, we just did a query of our fish passage barrier database. And so what I'm showing you here is the proportion of each of the in-stream feature types that we currently have as barriers in our database. And currently 84% of the barriers in our database are uh, culverts, um, followed by dams and then natural barriers. And this is an important um, note because as we are further defining the statute, it mentions dams and other obstructions, so this might be one of those points that we want to by name culverts as well. Next slide. We have a fish passage web application. This is where we make our database public. Um, you can see the um, the link is there at the bottom of the screen. You can also just uh, Google fish passage web application and this will come up for you. Um, it's updated weekly, which means that anybody using this pretty much has the same access to our database that we do in-house. It also has pretty much all the same tools that we use in our in-house GIS platforms. Um, you can also download sets of data. So if you're interested in um, prioritizing an area um, a specific geographic area or specific ownership, you can download those data and um, manipulate them in ArcGIS or um, other platforms. Next slide. And as I mentioned, habitat surveys are an important tool that help us to uh, order and prioritize barriers for correction. Um, our fish passage barrier assessments are based on the adult's ability to be able to navigate upstream of in-stream features. But we also then need to start thinking about what is the value of correcting one site over another? And that's where habitat surveys um, are one tool that can help us with that so that we can think about, you know, how much rearing habitat are we opening up? How much spawning habitat, et cetera? And we do have training available on uh, various habitat survey protocols. Next slide. And then finally, so all that all that work I just shared with you are all the services, the foundational services that we provide um, that lead up to barrier corrections. And we also provide um, support for removing barriers and installing fish, fish passable structures. I've provided the Washington Administrative Code there at the bottom for reference, but basically how it typically works is that a landowner would work with WDFW biologists and engineers and a um, correction would be developed um, that fits that unique site. Next slide. 
And the statute also mentions fishways very heavily because that was the correction at the time, time in 1949. Um, we do provide uh, support and there are existing rules for fish passage improvement structures. The Washington Administrative Code is, is there listed on the bottom. And um, same setup that landowners would work with our biologists and engineers. Um, here's a really good example of an excellent application of a fish passage improvement structure. On the left, you can see we have a water diversion dam that's full spanning and was shown to be a barrier to um, certain species at certain times of the year. And um, the correction was a roughened channel there on the, the left bank of that stream and the dam is still on the right bank so they're still able to withdraw water um, but the fish are able to pass upstream of that previously um, determined to be a barrier and now it's possible which is fantastic next slide and all of this work is um, our motivation, my motivation, is to contribute to better restoration outcomes so that we have projects that are effectively opening up salmon habitat. Um, so we can never again see pictures like the one on the left and um, more see pictures of just streams doing their thing. Next. And I wanted to thank you for your time and joining us this afternoon. And with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Well done, Christy. And we have several questions. So I'm going to scroll up to those here. Um, we do have uh, the next question uh, is one that uh, we thought maybe Margan was, would respond to, and then we have like three others for you to respond to, and Danny might help as well. So this is from Kenny Down. When developing a fish barrier passage, how do you intend to codify these regulations while allowing for high-tech fish passage systems such as volitional entry systems that use press, pressure differential to move salmon over dams, i.e. example, whoosh innovation system. Yeah, thanks Ben and hi Kenny, good question. Um, I think the, the simplest way to answer that is that our focus in the rulemaking, and, and generally this is the case for most of the rulemaking we do in the habitat program in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, is to try to focus on the outcomes that we want to ensure the rules meet. One of the things we've noticed, whether it's fish passage or construction projects in or near water or something else, is that the specific technologies change over time. So our goal is to try to um, focus as much as we can on the outcomes we want to ensure through the rulemaking um, and any associated standards that give us the greatest certainty about meeting those outcomes. Um, so that the rules themselves don't become too outdated too quickly. Um, one of the other pieces of that model is um, most robust right now in our, our hydraulic project approval rules, which is a different set of rules about construction projects um, in or near water. And we tend to have a provision that, that says something to the effect of, hey, we've done our best to publish the standards that we know about right now that, that the department approves of, but if there's another standard or approach that can achieve the same level of fish passenger screening or the same outcomes, then the department has the discretion to approve of those methods as well. And so I would envision something similar for this rulemaking. Um, in some, a focus on the outcomes we want, effective fish passage, effective fish screening um, and an acknowledgement that if there are other methods that um, demonstrate getting to the same outcomes and protecting fish in the same ways that that's something the department can approve. Um, so hopefully that leaves plenty of room for um, the innovation like you and others are doing. Thank you, Morgan. Oh. I'm trying to I'm trying to find my unmute button. I'm hovering and it wasn't popping up. So uh, excuse me for the delay there. Can you hear me OK now? We sure can. OK. All right. So the next question is from uh, Steve Lewis again. And the question is. Great information, but do these fish pass or do these passage inventories consider other species such as bull trout, lamprey, etc.? Christy? 
At this time, they they do not. We will list bull trout if we know that there's a distribution in that area. Um, but right now, the focus of our um, inventory and assessment work is uh, steelhead and salmon. But we are interested as an agency in all of those other fish. And I know Danny is doing a lot of work on lamprey and passage. Um, I think that's that's probably it, unless anybody else would like to jump in. Morgan? Yeah, no, great, um, great response, Christy. The only thing I would add um, more emphatically is that um, we do have a number of folks in the agency actively working on passage requirements for other species. And um, I think uh, where in, for example, in some of the dams, as we spoke earlier about, that are regulated more through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, we're actively engaging to try to understand what the passage requirements for those other species are and where we know that um, those species are or, or are trying to get to. We try to incorporate um, those kind of fish passage requirements wherever we can. Um, part of the challenge, and this may be related to some of the other questions that Danny and Christy can speak to, but um, part of the challenge is that as a state, because we have such a long history of uh, interest in and interdependence with salmon and steelhead and bull trout in some cases, those tend to be the species that we have the most information on and the most specific scientific data that helps us understand what their passage and screening needs are. And so a lot of the most specific and technical standards that we have do speak to the needs of salmon and steelhead. Um, as Christy mentioned in her presentation, to the degree we try to focus on, on sort of uh, the requirements of the weakest swimmers and the weakest jumpers, we hope that in doing so, we're, that's a good umbrella approach to protect the passage and screening requirements, requirements of most fish. But for those of you, and it sounds like there are a few who know quite a bit about fish, um, uh, an animal like a lamprey uh, swims and moves very, very differently. And so we're actively working on trying to understand how to how to articulate passage requirements uh, and screening requirements that are really effective for that different type of an animal. Um, and I'm sure Danny and others could speak more about that if, if someone was interested in additional detail. Great, thank you, Christy, and thank you, Morgan. We'll go on then to the next question. Is the reason you're only considering passage for salmon and steelhead because of the passage barrier lawsuit or specific to this presentation? Salmon and steelhead would not be representative of species needing passage in nearly one third of the state due to different life history strategies and uh, that do not migrate to the ocean. How does WDFW consider passage needs for other priority species such as resident trout, sturgeon, or lamprey? You've kind of addressed this already, uh, mm -hmm. But is there anything more to say? Yeah, I, I think that um, I can share that. My understanding of um, the, the beginnings of the fish passage division were that we saw a decline in salmon and steelhead. We were seeing a correlation with habitat and fish passage barriers. And so there was a unit within headquarters that was um, established to, to start working on this. Now, as far as handling all other uh, really important species aside from salmon and steelhead, our, our um, regional area habitat bios are, that's, that's where they are, they shine. That's, they, they know their local priorities, they know their habitat, they know their species, and, and they're the ones that are also permitting any, you know, in-stream work, um, et cetera. And so um, they're certainly important. That would, that would be my only addition. It's just with that our focus is, is salmon and steelhead, and we, we are in support of our regional area habitat bios that really are the, the experts in their areas on those other species. Great, thank you, Christy. Anyone else want to add anything further? Or we move on to the next question. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, great answer, Christy, right on. And, and the only other thing I would add is for the purposes of, of this presentation and sort of the whole agency rulemaking, um, doubling down on what I said earlier, the species that we know the most about to be very precise about the technical passage and screening standards tend to be um, salmon and steelhead. 
Um, and so for other species, as Christy said, sometimes we have to take a localized approach or um, really if we know it's in a location where one of those other species that behaves differently is in play, um, do the best we can with the science we have at that time and, and the, um, the passage or screening need that's there. So we, we do uh, not, I don't know that we're sure exactly how the rules will reflect some of that um, customized need for passage, effective passage and screening for species that may not be uh, there throughout the state, but that's definitely one of the outcomes that we'll be looking for as an agency in our fish passage and screening rulemaking. Um, and that does reflect our current practice, as Christy said. Great, thanks for that follow up, Morgan. So the next question is from Terry Wright. Why do you focus only on adults returning to spawn? Do you have data on how many smolts successfully make it to the ocean? Christy? Yeah, I think we got to get the fish up there first to start the cycle. And so um, we, we've got a lot of information. There's 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 a, a, a lot there, but there's we've got a lot of information on fish passage upstream and um, we've got some information on swimming ability of fish. And um, this has been the again taking a conservative approach this has been the the best method that we've seen over time to compare to determine fish passage barriers and then um so no we don't have information on 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 smolts returning back to the ocean we are we don't have that piece um okay thank you chrissy margan you want to add to that um just maybe just to say that um we do have in uh, the agency's fish program fish scientists working on estimating what the causes and sources of mortality are to out migrating smolts so um, it's not as precise as sort of population counts of smolts returning to the ocean um, but actually right now um, the agency is engaged in trying to take a fresh look at all of the um, field monitoring that we do to gather data about um, where those adults are spawning, how successfully we think those um, uh, eggs are rearing and getting to the smolt stage um, to let us have a little bit more comprehensive of a look at what the um, productivity is in freshwater and maybe start to get a, a more precise handle on what some of those different sources of mortality are. We do have a couple of studies in the agency um, of um, particular locations where there's been a grant or some other funding opportunity that's less that let us do a little bit more detailed um, smolt surveys. Um, and we know, for example, there are some parts of the Columbia where um, there are significant sources of mortality to the, the um, to put it simply, the baby fish trying to get out to the ocean. A lot of different causes. Um, so, uh, and maybe this is where Danny, if you could add anything about screening, we know that, um, for example, um, getting uh, held by water pressure against an ineffective screen, Danny, I think he called it impingement, the technical word in his presentation, that can be a risk particularly for smaller fish, including smolts. And so those are, su uh, those are some of the considerations that go into screening. Um, for passage, um, particularly in places where we have big dams, um, we do try to think about passage, but it's a little bit more simple. A lot of baby fish pass through the spillways of dams. And so one of the considerations when we're working with dam owners or with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is um, how much water gets spilled, what's the velocity of that spill water, specifically in order to try to protect those out migrating um, smolts from um, being tumbled up, so to speak, so much that it's actually a source of mortality. So again, we do think about those things, um, but uh, the, the specifications are a little bit more general. We don't quite have the same technical data that we do on adult fishes swimming ability moving upstream. Hopefully that helps a little bit. And Danny, please, if you'd like to add. Great, thank you, Morgan. 
Danny, do you have anything to add? I don't see you're on camera, so I'm suggest I'm thinking maybe not. Probably feel like Morgan covered it. All right, so we'll go on to the next question then. Uh, so this is from Eileen Levy. Uh, if possible, can you indicate the degree of response or non-response of Washington land and business owners to address barriers to fish passage? Christine? Uh, yeah, Ben, ben um, I'd be happy to take that one. Great, so, thank you, Tom. Eileen, um, you, you know, I guess uh, I'll, I'll try not to to get on my soapbox because uh, that, that's that's really what my division's around for. Um, but the, the state's been settled for over 150 years and it, it's taken us that long to kind of get in the predicament that we're in. Um, we estimate that there's about 40,000 uh, barriers to adult salmon steelhead uh, to get them up to um, you know, their natal streams. Uh, and I think on Danny's slide where he showed unscreened diversions, I, I think he was up there around 40,000 unscreened diversions or water intakes within the state. So it's taken us a long time to kind of get in this predicament. And the, the effect of that is, is that we've seen salmon runs uh, steadily decline. And then marker species like the southern resident orca start to decline. Um, so cities, counties, uh, private individuals that that have these fish passage barriers underneath their transportation network. So a, a private individual, maybe their driveway crosses uh, a fish bearing stream, um, or you know a stream that a city street or a county road crosses. Um, uh, they are becoming aware uh, of this issue. Um, you know, we saw it uh, over about the last ten years with the uh, the federal injunction now that that's been imposed on the state. But that injunction um, that was that was brought by the federal government against the state uh, only covers uh, fish passage barriers under state owned roadways with, within a specific case area, which is roughly uh, western Washington and waters that flow into Puget Sound or the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Um, the, the tab for that right now, just that that state piece, you know, the estimate right now is about four billion dollars to, to make that fix. Um, the, one of the big problems that private individuals and cities and counties have is, is the high cost of these corrections. Uh, a typical fish passage culvert at the end of a, a private landowner's driveway, they're averaging around $145,000, $145,000. A city or a county correction, about a million. Uh, a, a DOT correction under a state route or the interstate, they're averaging about $5 million. So. Yes, they're they're aware of this issue. Uh, um, we're doing these outreach briefings to to try to raise awareness also, um, and we've had good responses from from all all types of uh, barrier owners, um, and we've seen that with the uh, the grants that the state uh, and the federal government issues for fish passage. Uh, we have, you know, record. Uh, amounts of people applying for NRCS grants that are part of Department of Agriculture, um, the Fish Barrier Removal Board, the Family Forest Fish Passage Program, the Salmon Recovery Funding Board. Uh, we're seeing record number of applications for people uh, seeking money uh, to help them make these corrections. Great, thank you, Tom, for that response. We've had another comment come in. This is not a question, but a comment it says uh, this is from Kent Snyder. I'm certain there is a significant body of knowledge within the department, Department of Fish and Wildlife, about resident trout biology. In fact, the weakest swimmer criteria is a small trout. Thus, it would seem relevant to include resident trout in this review. Christy, did you want to respond to that? And then Margan? Sure, and, and we do, I, I, I didn't mean to, um to uh, insinuate that we didn't we don't include resident trout we do that's actually um, one of our species that we um, definitely note when we are doing fish passage assessments even if it happens that the site that we are doing a barrier assessment on is not does not have salmon or steelhead that would be able to access that stream it, it is just that our 
just kind of dialing home like this is the in, in taking a conservative approach. I think I glazed over the resident tout piece, but we we do consider them and and thank you for bringing that up. Excellent. Thank you, Christy. I don't see that we have any other questions, uh, but we really appreciate all the questions that have been asked, the thoughtful uh, questions and responses. And um, and with that, I think we will go ahead to the next presentation. So the next presentation is on climate change and how it affects uh, fish passage. So Jane Atha is going to give this presentation and you can see her title and where she works uh, right there on the screen. And with that, Jane, take it away. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here and again, very grateful to have such a, uh, an active participation uh, with with this briefing and um, I am looking forward to talking to you about how not only we design culverts to um, better accommodate all fish life uh, and life stages but um, how we might do so in thinking about climate change so so looking into the future on these um, uh, on all these different uh, barrier removals that we're we're doing. Um, so to begin, I just wanted to um, let you know who I am. I'm a fluvial geomorphologist, and um, you may be wondering what that is exactly. Uh, and it, it basically is, you know, a fancy way of saying river scientist. Geo meaning earth, morph is looking at the changing earth, and then fluvial is the flowing of water. So rivers and streams and how that, um, how the rivers and streams actually um, create these uh, beautiful floodplains and river landscapes and habitat for our very important fish species. So I wanted to, um, again, I think Christy did a great job illustrating the problem of barrier culverts on the landscape. And again, now this work takes it a step forward to look at, okay, um, now that we are actively removing these barrier culverts and yet we're still just, you know, building new roads, that's not gonna change. How can we do so in a way that is going to maintain habitat for today as well as into the future? We expect culverts to be in the landscape anywhere from 30 up to 100 years. And within that time frame, we do expect um, impacts from climate change to occur that may affect these projects and have implications for habitat. Uh, next slide, please. So to put this into considerations for the rulemaking process, um, we want folks to begin thinking about what factors WDFW might consider when we're weighing criteria and standards that uh, might require a wider culvert structure uh, to accommodate future flows that we anticipate from climate change. And this will hopefully make more sense as I present the work. Next slide, please. So a little bit about uh, DFW's role in culvert design. So we really um, provide design guidelines and guidance for fish passage culverts. So culverts that are really intended to simulate the stream and allow fish to move freely up and down beneath the roads. We issue permits for the installation of most culverts uh, and we enforce those regulations. We also design culverts for our own lands and other climate or in other climate clients, excuse me. And uh, we review a lot of designs and provide a lot of technical assistance. Next slide, please. So the Washington state climate is changing and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Next slide. The key regional response that we anticipate is to see less snow and more rain. So we anticipate about the same amount of precipitation, but in the future, it's going to fall more as rain and less so as snow. And that is gonna have implications in terms of peak flows, both we, an we anticipate seeing higher peak flows and then also shifts in the timing of those flows. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration of how we might look at um, changes in snow, rain, 
basins. So if you imagine that this black V here in this cartoon is actually a valley and at the at the bottom is a stream and that blue line across is our freezing level. Well, the precipitation above that freezing level falls as snow and that snow falls and remains stored onto those hill slopes for a significant amount of time. And then below that freezing level, the precipitation falls as rain and more quickly runs off the hill slopes and moves down into the streams. And we see higher stream flows and more water again moving downstream. Next slide, please. So as we anticipate our temperatures to increase and again causing that decrease in the amount of snow because that freezing level is going to rise and we're going to have less snow falling on the hill slopes and being stored there and more precipitation falling as rain, which is going to increase the amount of runoff that we have quickly moving off of our hill slopes and into our streams. This is going to cause more runoff throughout the year. Next slide, please. So we also anticipate changes in rain dominant basins. So we're anticipating again shifts in seasonality. So we we'll see likely more intense rain events in the winter. This is already trending in that direction. And then conversely, we will have drier summers, so less water in the streams to support habitat in those dry summer months. Next slide. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about geomorphic culvert design. Next slide. So when I introduced my title as a fluvial geomorphologist, I was talking about how I really look at the way that flowing water moves sediment and other things such as vegetation and wood and rivers that really uh, create the rivers we see on the landscape today and provide fish habitat. And the, our current way of thinking about fish passage culvert design is to try and simulate these geomorphic processes. And the way we do that is we really try to create a channel underneath the roadway that simulates the channel that we find upstream and downstream of that crossing. So with this, we anticipate having fish passage inside the culvert and road crossing to be comparable to the fish passage that we see outside of that road crossing. Next slide, please. So we primarily permit two different types of fish passage culverts, and one is our no slope culvert. And this is uh, intended for smaller streams that are less than 10 feet wide from left bank to right bank and are pretty low slope, so it, they're pretty flat. And then um, we also permit designs for what we call a stream simulation culvert, which goes beyond the width of the stream by about 1.2 times the bankful width of that stream, plus an additional 10 feet. And what that does is it allows, again, more of these geomorphic processes. It allows the water and the sediment and whatever else might be working its way through the roadway to maintain passage and, and to continue to provide that simulated stream. And one of the key things I want uh, to emphasize is that this metric that we call bankful width is the primary um, measurement that we use to design and permit culverts. So we measure the width of the stream and we design how we would like the channel to look through the roadway and we size the culvert structure to be at least as wide as the stream, if not significantly wider. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about how future changes in climate, like I had spoken about previously, impacts culverts and culvert design, um, it's just an important thing to understand that the, the changes in climate is going to change the stream morphology and how the amounts of runoff and sediment, et cetera, are going to affect the sizes of the stream. Next slide, please.
So this particular project um, is looking at projected changes in that bankful width due to climate change. Next slide, please. So we had a modeling process where we looked at global climate models. So we selected models that are um, best representative of Washington State. And with those projections of future temperatures and precipitation, we input that into um, a hydrologic model. And hydrologic models really um, predict the amount of runoff and water that we anticipate will be coming through our streams and creeks. And we're able to, with that, um, estimate the amount of water that, that dictates how wide on average our streams will be through time. Um, it's called a bankful flow, which we can in turn use to estimate the projected bankful widths. So again, how wide those streams are going to be um, into the future and based on future flows that we are using from data that we've gotten from global climate models. Next slide, please. So we worked with uh, the University of Washington's Climate Impacts Group, and they are the ones that really provided us with the climate science data. Next slide. And then our agency took those data and turned it into our currency for geomorphic culvert design, which is that bankful width and produced predicted bankful width changes. Next slide. So we're really interested in looking at where the changes are expected to occur across the state and um, what the magnitude or how large we anticipate those changes to be. And then also how likely it is that we can expect to see those changes in stream widths. Next slide. So this map illustrates statewide what we see when we're looking at predicted increases or decreases in channel widths through time. So this is an outward look looking at the 2080s. So again, future time scenario and we're comparing future bankful widths with modeled historic bankful widths to show you, okay, here's where we're seeing increases anticipated in bankful width um, in the Cascades and the Olympics and other areas, high elevation areas, we're seeing you know, pretty big increases in bankful width projected for that time frame. Again, keeping in mind that this is the 2080s is how long we anticipate a lot of our road culverts to be um, in, in the landscape. And then also in some areas of the state, we're seeing um, projected decreases in channel widths. Next slide, please. What this slide shows you is how confident we are that these increases will occur in bankful width. The key thing to take away from this is that the little areas in red, we have 10 global climate models, which is the full number that we use to look at changes in bankful width, are all telling us that there's going to be an increase. And because of that, we can feel pretty confident that in those parts of the state, we'll see an increase in bankful width into the future. Um, on the flip side, if you look at the blues, zero out of the 10 models that we analyzed are predicting an increase in bankful width. So we can feel pretty confident that we're not gonna see those changes. And then, you know, as you get into the yellows and oranges, um, kind of in those mid zones, that's where you have to weigh the risk uh, and other factors based on your project and, and roadway to think about climate change in those instances. Next slide, please. So with these results, our agency has um, developed a climate adapted culverts web application. Next slide, please. And um, this is available to the public. Uh, however, it's it's currently under some some technical difficulties, but it is generally available. 
Um, it's uh, an interface where anyone can log in and go and click anywhere in the state. And then what it will do is um, say you have a, a you click on a road crossing, it will delineate the drainage area so all the runoff that is going to go through that road crossing above it and then tell you for that spot uh, what the projected change in bankful width is anticipated to be as well as what the anticipated change in the 100 year flood discharge will be so 100 year being that much bigger storm that a lot of engineers use to design these types of infrastructure projects next slide please so this is an example of the type of report that you can print out as a PDF. Um, it will tell you, you just type in your project location, it'll show you the drainage area, um, the different bankful flows, 100 year flows, the projected changes that we see. And I, and I wanna be pretty clear about that. You're not gonna get um, an output for like a, an exact discharge or flow rate. You're going to get a percent change. So if it's an increase, it will come out in this example as say, okay, in the 2080s, there's anticipated to be a 10% increase in bankful width, for example. And then it goes on further and shows you a lot more information just depending on how detailed you want to get and looking at the spread among the different models that we analyzed for this work. And um, again, you can get a lot of really rich information depending on how deep you want to go. Next slide. So the bottom line is that uh, bankful width, so this channel widths that we use to divine, excuse me, to design culverts um, are anticipated to increase in many watersheds due to climate change. So because of that, many culverts are at risk of being undersized. Uh, we now have a spatially explicit statewide assessment of the magnitude and likelihood of changes in bankful width that we anticipate. And um, we have also developed a framework for addressing the um, inherent uncertainty that we have when we're looking at climate change projections. Next slide. So once again, um, I'm showing you the consideration for rulemaking. So this is, again, uh, as we're moving forward, what factors and this would be great to get feedback on, what factors should we be considering when we're weighing the criteria and standards for requiring wider culverts that are going to accommodate those future projections and bankful width? And again, this is really to try and avoid being back where we are with you know thousands of barrier culverts on the landscape. We want to design culverts that will remain simulating the stream in the decades to come. Next slide. Okay, I think that's it and I'm happy to take any questions. Great job, Jane. We do you have some questions. Um, however, they're more general questions and I think you're off the hook. Okay, I'm happy with that. Thanks everyone, I appreciate All right. it. All right, so um, the first question is, this goes back to the last presentation, but to all of the presentations. It is my understanding that National Marine Fisheries Service might be updating their guidelines and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is in the process of developing passage guidelines for bull trout, lamprey, and other resident species. How will WDFW consider or incorporate any new guidance in the future? Danny, are you ready to answer that question? I I hope that you guys can see me. It looks to me like my video is on. Can you see me okay, Ben? I can hear you and I can see you now. Okay, all right. Sorry about that technical difficulties, folks. Well, that's a great question. It's an important question and I will try to not talk for three hours with the answer. I think, first of all, on the NIMPS um, criteria update. I actually just spoke with a couple of their representatives last week and that document should be coming out um, by the end of summer, they're saying, hopefully. And that is primarily updates on their fish screening rules and they, again, didn't really change anything. They're just clarifying some things that garnered 
frequent questions. Uh, we had the opportunity at WFW to go over a pre-final draft. We had the ability to comment and make suggestions, make edit suggestions, and so we had a lot of uh, partnership in generating these updates and we're excited about them. I can also say that uh, WFW were part of the Fish Screening and Oversight Committee and NOAA is involved in that. That's Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Montana, sometimes California, um, and many of the federal services and tribal partners. And through that body, we actually collectively reviewed what NOAA's updates are, or NIMS's updates are, sorry. So we're very familiar with those. As far as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services updates on lamprey passage and bull trout passage, luckily that's another thing where we have really strong communication with our federal partner there. Um, my staff is in charge of monitoring some of the reservoirs along I-90 and um, on White Pass down there as well for bull trout passage as the reservoirs decline to the creeks that are upstream of them. So we're familiar with what's going on there. We talk with them regularly about needs for fish way design and say bull trout, bull trout moving both upstream and kelts coming downstream. So we have looked at the best management practices for both bull trout and lamprey and always use them. Luckily, they're not in conflict with anything that WFW does in common practice. It's nice that they support each other. I think really the, the take home part of this question was, you know, how will WFW respond to any potential tweaks that maybe we haven't already accounted for, uh, either from NIMS or from US Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, with a species that we don't know as much about, we're still sort of learning, like Pacific lamprey in particular. Well, WFW is building adult Pacific lamprey passage structures to go in at Prosser Dam on the lower Yakima River. We're working with the Bureau of Reclamation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Yakima Nation on that project. We've done work with USGS and Yakima Nation and Oregon Fish and Wildlife on how the Salmonid standards for fish screening impact downstream migrating juvenile lamprey. It's really interesting stuff. I wish I could say we knew everything there was to know about it, but we are learning and we're engaged. So I think that's maybe the most important part is that we're communicating and the standards that they're coming out with will not be a surprise to us. We helped create them in many cases um, and our rules are adaptive. If something comes out that makes sense, I'm sure that we're going to be on the forefront willing to change them. So um, with that, I think maybe Margan has something that she would like to share. Oh, you, you just got to it, Danny. I just wanted to make sure people understand that, as you said, our, our rules are adaptive. Our intent is to change over time. Um, in other places where we have rules, um, sometimes, uh, so tremendous amount of work to do rulemaking. So the only caveat I would say is that um, sometimes some of the tweaks we want to make um, stack up a little bit so that we can be efficient with the limited effort and resources that we have and, and make a lot of those tweaks if they're not major all at one time. Um, the other the other technique we've used is um, as an agency publishing um, an addendum, for example, providing interim guidance until we're able to change the rules and making sure that that's really transparent, that that's clearly posted um, to anyone who needs to know that that there is an addendum to the rules. Um, so that's another technique. Great, thank you, Morgan, and thank you, Danny, for those responses. Morgan, if you'll stay on, we've got another question. I think that uh, probably best for you to answer. Uh, answer. So again, this is from Eileen. As a policy wonk, I'm curious if you had to identify it today. What do you anticipate to be the most difficult portion of your rule to develop slash revise? Good, good, good question. Um, I think, I mean, as you as you've heard today, there is just a tremendous amount of um, technical knowledge, ongoing research to learn more about the about the pieces that we don't have nailed down yet. For example, uh, passage standards for lamprey. So the the challenge is not uh, a tremendous amount of technical knowledge. I think the hardest part about this rulemaking is um, more like the people side and the implementation side. So as you saw from both. Danny's presentation and from Christy's presentation, um, when you look at the geography of the state, um, the, the magnitude, the scope and scale of the challenges where we, in terms of fish passage and correcting fish passage barriers or improving screens or making sure that current diversions are screened is pretty big. Um, and so even once WDFW, even once we've been able to be clear about 
what kinds of structures and responses are effective fish passage mechanisms or are effective screening mechanisms. The reality is that the scope and scale of this problem is so large that it's not the kind of thing that government can regulate its way out of. Um, and so I think the pressure is really on, um, on us, on our partners and other agencies, on our work with the legislature to try to figure out how do we uh, prioritize for the limited amount of resources, whether that's our own or whether that's the resources of landowners out there, how do we want to prioritize uh, our efforts um, to actually get the most benefit to the most fish as quickly as possible? Um, so that I hopefully that answers your question, Eileen. I, I really think that's the, the heart of it. And, and as you heard from Tom right at the beginning, um, the current cultural expectations around government, rightfully so, are about helping people be in compliance with the law and sort of bringing public resources to bear to, to help get those outcomes we need. Um, and there, there are a couple of parts of this particular law that are a little outdated. So we're not going to, we're also not going to get to those outcomes we want for fish um, by um, just starting to go onto private property and, and fixing these uh, barriers or screening challenges. Um, so again, that how do we bring technical assistance? How do we bring resources um, to actually get the results on the ground that we want? Great, thank you, Morgan. We do have another question. Uh, this is from Terry Wright. Uh, how are you determining which areas to correct first? I.e. the Southern residents are running out of time and need Chinook now. And I think Tom said he would go ahead and take a first crack at answering this question. Tom? Good afternoon, Terry. Uh, again, this is Tom Jamison. So this rulemaking, it's really got, you know, three main goals. We're, we're looking to have clear standards uh, we're looking to um, have compliance with the laws, and then we're, we're, we're looking to establish rules for people that will not comply. Um, this rulemaking uh, isn't intended to, uh, it's not a prioritization scheme for, for which barriers will be corrected first or which, which unscreened diversions will be screened first. Now that the state does have a very robust um, salmon recovery network. Uh, the state's broken down into salmon recovery regions. There's regional fishery enhancement groups, lead entities, uh, there's conservation groups. And then uh, I mentioned earlier, there, there's several um, fish passage um, grant programs, federal on the federal side, uh, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS. On the state side, the Family Forest Fish Passage Program, the Surf Board, and, and then a board that, that I currently have the privilege to chair, the, the Fish Bear Removal Board. Uh, one of the things that the legislature uh, last session in January uh, tasked the board to do, which is to, uh, to come up with a new strategy uh, to prioritize fish passage corrections uh, using state dollars um, to where they'll make the biggest impact um, that will increase um, salmon species that are limiting harvest and that are, are you know, impacting marker species like the southern resident killer whales. So that's something that the board, uh, the Fish Bear Removal Board is, is working on. Uh, we have a preliminary report due to the legislature uh, this coming fall, and then a final report, I think in about, you know, eight months to a year. But, um, uh, this rulemaking in particular isn't, isn't about prioritizing barriers or, or corrections. Great. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that response. And I don't see that we have any other questions uh, in the queue at this time. So maybe what I'll do is I'll provide just a quick recap of kind of where we go from here. And then Margan, turn over to you for some concluding thoughts. So, um, First of all, thank, thank you everybody for your participation today. We've been going almost two hours and I know we've probably all uh, had our share of, uh, of online meetings and uh, they're not the funnest thing to sit through, um, but you've been great and you've asked great questions and, uh, and shown a real engagement today. We really appreciate that. We're willing, uh, we're able to accept additional feedback uh, through this Friday. July 31st, you can email any additional comments or questions at this email address, fishpassagerules at dfw.wa.gov. Uh, as you may have seen in the communication earlier in the Q&A, 
Uh, all of the presentations as well as other materials are available at the website uh, that's shown on the screen. Um, after the 31st, the agency will take all of the input that they've received and begin to start laying out policy direction. Uh, if you will, kind of outlining the elements that will be in the rule or that could be in the rule. And, and those will be shared then again at meetings this fall. Uh, and then after that additional feedback, we will have um, opportunity for more feedback and, and uh, when the draft rule is issued uh, and then go through the formal hearing and adoption process as we outlined earlier. And, and uh, I've been reminded that it's a soft date for July 31st. So if you don't make uh, this Friday and you submit comments over the next few weeks, that's no problem. Uh, we will uh, accept those and, and happily welcome those comments as we go forward. So thanks again, everybody. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Margan for some concluding comments. Thanks, Ben, and and really thanks to the whole DFW team. Um, as you can see, there's a bunch of really professional engaged folks here, so I'm grateful for them as well. Um, but but also to you, I wanted to reiterate my thanks for you being here today, as Ben said, and asking a lot of questions. Um, as, as you've heard and Ben uh, reminded us of, we really are looking for an iterative process in developing these rules. We take it very seriously that um, although the statute has been around for a long time and we have a robust set of programs um, we, we don't take lightly developing rules um, i think the opportunity to provide transparency and clarity for the public for people who are interested is really exciting and i welcome that um, and as you as you can hear and a little bit of the response to eileen's question about what's going to be most difficult this is a big um Fish passage and screening in general is an important but also widespread challenge. And um, so I think that iterative process and the feedback we get from you and many others is really important to us. Um, so we can get the rules as right as possible. Uh, even as we focus on those outcomes, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier relative to Kenny's question, um, there's still a lot for us to work out. And um, again, I, I hope you will continue to tune in and. Give us that feedback and be patient as we engage in that iterative process. I think it's a good one for government to engage in, um, but it, it, it does um, ask more of you and others to be engaged. So thanks in advance for your patience and persistence. Um, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. Great, thank you, Morgan. So we did have one final comment or question about when is this recorded session gonna be uh, made available? So today's meeting and uh, it'll be on that same website. Uh, there's already a recorded uh, presentation or meeting from, from one of our earlier meetings available out there. We can make this one also available on the web page. Is there anything else in terms of final comments? Okay, well, uh, thanks everybody. We had at least 33 people attending today and really appreciate you taking the time and. Hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and we'll look forward to receiving additional feedback and seeing you in the next round of meetings. Take care.